Olympic cyclists travel around velodromes at phenomenal speeds. Track sprinters will reach over 80 kilometers per hour, whereas team pursuiters will aim to average over 65 kilometers per hour for four kilometers. But what makes them so quick? Well, world-class physiology and quads of steel certainly help. But the bikes and equipment they use also play a massive part. So in this video, I'm gonna explain how and why. The Olympic Games, they're a big deal, usually happening every four years. It's where the world's best athletes come together to try and win gold medals. And cycling is one of the few sports in the Olympics that allows nations to develop their own specialist equipment to try and gain an advantage over their competitors. And this is a key part of the sport. But how much difference does it make? And how much difference would it make compared to a standard bike and clothing that you could pick up in your local bike shop? Well, thanks to maths and physics, we can work it out. The bikes in the Olympics have to weigh 6.8 kilograms. As per the UCI rules, this is typically lighter than your bike or the bikes that most people ride. They're usually around eight to nine kilograms. But if you're willing to sell one of your kidneys, you could buy a bike that's lighter than what they're allowed in the Olympics, but you just wouldn't be able to use it in the Olympics. Anyway, weight isn't the biggest factor here, contrary to popular belief. The biggest things that make these riders so fast are aerodynamics, rolling resistance, and drivetrain friction, in that order. World-class sprinters typically have a peak power output of 2,000 watts, which is massive. I mean, if you're fit and you're in good shape, then you can probably do just over 1,000 watts. I can't, I can't do over 1,000 watts, though. But anyway, world-class pursuiters, they aim to average 600 watts for four minutes, which is also massive. And the average person on the street they could probably do 200 watts for four minutes. Now, if we take that world-class pursuiter and those 600 watts, and we put them on a standard road bike and put them on a standard road and standard clothing, then we can work out that they would be able to average around 48 to 49 kilometers per hour, or 30 miles per hour, if you prefer Imperial. Now, that's still rapid, but it's way off the 65 kilometers an hour that they aim to average in the Olympics on the track. So what makes the track so much faster. Well, they head on down to Gainsbury's and go shopping for some gains. Oh, by the way, for our American viewers, that's a play on Sainsbury's, which is um, a popular grocery store here in the United Kingdom. First, they use a dedicated track cycling frame. Once you remove the gears, the brakes, the derailleurs, the water bottles, your saddlebag, your streamers, your spoky dokies and your reflectors and all that gubbins, you make the bike much more streamlined and much more aerodynamic. And the world's best bikes, they're made from carbon fiber and they're designed in wind tunnels and using computational fluid dynamics to be as aerodynamic and as stiff as possible. The difference between the best and worst track bikes at the Olympics is around 0 0.008 CDA. CDA is the coefficient drag area. You don't need to worry about that and what that number means. But in pursuit terms, it's worth around two seconds over a four kilometer pursuit, which might not sound like much to you, but it's huge when you consider that the winning margins in that event are typically tenths of seconds. Next, they put on some fancy schmancy carbon fiber disc wheels. These lenticular discs are really cool and they make a fat whomp 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 sound as they they go around. Also, they're way more aerodynamic than standard wheels with spokes that kind of just like slosh around in the wind like a giant whisk. They have really smooth, nice rolling bearings as well. I mean, just imagine, like compare it to you stood in your kitchen waving around a whisk or waving around a knife. I'm sure you do both of those things all of the time. Next, onto rolling resistance and tires. And the track tires they use are super important. They're also very thin, 19 to 23 millimeters, and they're pumped up to high pressure, around 150 to 200 PSI. This is a narrower tire than what you find on most road bikes these days, and a much higher pressure. They're also made from special compounds that have lower rolling resistance, and they have like no puncture protection in them whatsoever. But fortunately, punctures on the track 
are really rare. The tyres also contain latex inner tubes to help reduce rolling resistance and friction further. And the track itself is made from Siberian pine, which creates a really smooth and fast surface. And all in, the combination of fast rolling tyres and smooth surface helps the athletes go at least another one kilometre per hour faster for the same power output compared to what they would do on tarmac or, if you're in America, asphalt. Track bikes are single speed, and this makes them more efficient than standard road bikes that have gears. The 11 speed gears that might be on your bike are typically around 3% efficient when they're in their optimal gear combination and when it's clean. Is your bike clean right now? If it's not, get some muck off on it. However, track bikes can be more efficient than that. Having one gear means that the chain line is always perfectly straight, and riding indoors means that they don't get dirty. Dirt slows your drivetrain down. In addition, they use fancy friction-reducing waxes and lubricants on their chains, and they use bigger sprockets too. Bigger sprockets mean that the chain actuates, bends less, and there's less friction in it. And all in, this helps reduce the friction of the drivetrain to around 1.5%. It's not much, but it equates to around 0.5 km per hour extra speed over your standard road bike. Oh, but why do they only have one gear, I hear you ask? Well, gears are there on road bikes to help you ride up changes in gradient on different terrains, but in the velodrome, it's just the same all the time, hence they only need one gear. Next is position. Now, the power that world-class track riders produce is all the more impressive when you consider the positions they adopt on the bike. They train relentlessly to contort their bodies into scrunched up little postures on the bike because this makes them more aerodynamic. You want to be as small as possible. But in order to be able to do that, you have to train an incredible amount and have really good core strength. The body position is more important than the bike itself because it presents a much bigger object to the wind. And adopting an aerodynamic position can give you an additional four to eight kilometers per hour. And so what you cover your body in is also highly important, which brings us nicely on to skin suits and helmets. The skin suits that riders wear in the Olympics are closely guarded secrets, and for the games, it's become common practice for riders to wear a fresh, different suit for each round of a competition. And these suits are said to cost anywhere between 300 and 500 pounds, euros, or dollars a go. Wow. I mean, fortunately, the uh, the t-shirts and, and hoodies that we have in the GCN shop are far more affordable than that, and you can wear them more than once. What makes these suits so expensive is that they're completely custom and tailored to the individual rider, making them fit like a second skin. But it's not just being tight that makes them fast. The fabrics themselves are cutting edge, very aerodynamic, more aerodynamic than skin. They also feature special seams or trip strips in key locations to trip the airflow as it passes over the rider from laminar flow to turbulent flow, and therefore it's able to stay attached to the rider for longer. And this reduces the size of the wake behind the rider. The wake behind a rider is an area of low pressure which sucks you backwards. So if you reduce the size of the wake, you get less sucking and you go faster. Boom! The helmets they wear are again to improve aerodynamics and riders try and wear a helmet where the tail of the helmet integrates nicely into their back and it's just a nice flowing line. They try and hold their body and their head so that the head sits perfectly in line with the torso. And when you add up the helmet and the skin suit combined, it saves a huge amount of power. Again, we're looking at an increase in average speed of around five to eight kilometers per hour, which is a huge gain from Gainsbury's. Add all these gains up, and that is how they travel so quick on, on top of the quads of steel. Anyway, this is the main reason the technology continually improving that we've seen Olympic records get broken at every successive Olympics. It's not that us humans are evolving and becoming faster, because evolution happens over thousands and millions of years. It's that we're improving our equipment. And this is why the world record progression in other sports that have standardized equipment is much slower. 
Hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you have, please give it a thumbs up. Let us know down in the comments what you think of Olympic track tech and any questions you might have. And if you'd like to watch more videos on track cycling and what it takes to ride the track and the skill involved, then, well, we've got videos on that too. See you later.